Welcome back to Sputnik. Now, it's absolutely clear that the United States is using the time of corona to intensify their regime change operations, particularly in Venezuela, even more particularly in the case of Iran. Earlier, I caught up with the legendary Australian academic, author and campaigner Tim Anderson, and I asked him, leaving aside the morality of that, is it going to work on the ground? Yes, you're right, George. The US, has, of course, has been trying to isolate and break Iran for 40 years, pretty much, uh, more than 40 years. And they've doubled down on their sanctions during this coronavirus uh, crisis to make it more difficult for the public health system in Iran to get along. Now, they have quite a good, a robust public health system, but of course, like everyone else, they do depend on getting in out certain outside drugs and certain outside services, you know. So they make, the US is making it much more difficult for Iran, which has one of the worst crises at the moment, to deal with that. In, in a way, it's the second or third worst uh, in the world, and yet Pompeo this week announced an increase in sanctions. From your long uh, experience of these things, how is that likely to play down on the streets of Iran? Is that going to make regime change more or less likely? I'm thinking, for example, of the Cuban uh, example. Mm. More than 40 years under sanctions, yet still standing tall and quite prominent in this crisis. Well, it doesn't endear the Americans to the Iranian people. That's one thing. But, uh, of course, it depends on the Iranian government and how they look after their people. And they have got a, a very good track record, by the way. If we go to an independent source, the UNDP, we'll see that human development in Iran is second only to China in the last three decades. So there have been enormous improvements in health and education, for example. But that I don't, really matters to Washington because their approach to sanctions, as they did with Cuba, as they've done with a number of other countries, is to try and tighten the screws and make the system scream and make people desperate. I was just looking back at a debate I did a year ago uh, in which uh, the supporters of empire endlessly prattled about a rules-based order. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought at the time a year ago it was a tad hypocritical, but as you put it, the people who shout loudest about the rules-based order are the people who break all the existing rules. Yeah, this is something that is bringing to a head a lot of the contradictions of what used to be called a neoliberal system with a lot of ideas about free markets and open markets. But we have a world full of sanctions and economic blockades, the most illiberal system you could imagine. I think it's rather a, a symptom of the fact that the empire is in decline and it's a bit more dangerous in those sort of circumstances. It's trying all sorts of things to maintain its supremacy, maintain its technological supremacy over China. One of our soldiers uh, lost her life uh, this week in, uh, in a camp in Iraq. I think at least two American uh, forces also died. The United States is under increasing attack for its presence in Iraq, which may itself be illegal because of the decision of the Iraqi parliament to ask the foreign armies to leave. That's debatable because there's a question of the powers of the president and the prime minister and the parliament and so on. But legal or not legal, the presence of foreign forces in Iraq is also now looking uh, distinctly shaky. Yes, it is. And uh, they're being made, uh, it's being made clear to them that they're not welcome. There's been a lot of low-level attacks on U.S. bases, most recently that one north of Baghdad you mentioned. I believe in recent days also there have been moves for the, uh, the U.S. troops to move out of al Qaim, which is one of the border towns up towards Hasaka in Syria. So a couple of border... The border points have been very sensitive for the U.S. because they've been also trying to prevent a coordination between the Syrian and the Iraqi armies, but apparently they're surrendering the al Qaim uh, camp to the Iraqi military. This, in a, I mean, if the whole uh, Iraq invasion was about demonstrating to the world uh, the hegemony of the United States, its overwhelming dominant power, it hasn't worked really, has it? No, and of course, earlier this year, they did a great deal of damage uh, with the assassination of the commanders Soleimani and Mohandas, and that unified the Iraqi people more than anything. Now, what about Syria, which is uh, the subject of one of your magnificent books, The Dirty War on Syria. Uh, well, tell us first why, why you call it a dirty war. 
I think because my experience had been in Latin America where the phrase was used, that they were, they were using the Contras against Nicaragua, for example, and they were doing secret assassinations in Operation Condor in the south. There was a whole history of those sorts of wars. And uh, what bothered me about Syria was that very few in the Western left liberal anti-war movement really rallied to it. They were sucked in by this idea that it was a humanitarian intervention, as, as in the case of Libya. And so with uh, Syria, there's been a massive uh, scale of propaganda about what is really going on there, the demonization of the, the government, the Syrian army and so on, the, the constant claims that they are targeting children in hospitals, these sorts of things. Sheer war propaganda, but nevertheless, the reaction from the internationalism in the West was, was very, very muted for a long time. I think it's grown a bit, but it's still in a minority. The use of proxies automatically uh, entails dirtiness, doesn't it? Because yeah. if you are not yourself as a democracy held to some sort of account by your people uh, engaging in a war, but rather are enabling others to do so, however dirty those are, and mm -hmm. some of our allies in the Syrian proxy war have filmed themselves mm -hmm. cutting off children's heads and mm. executing priests mm. and so on. Uh, it, it, it follows, doesn't it, ineluctably, that if you are not yourself engaged in the war, and things can go wrong even then, mm -hmm. but you're paying, arming, propagandizing for other allies, dirtiness is an automatic, an axiom, isn't it? Yes, I agree. But I think also there's another word for it, which is really coined by the liberal side of US politics, which is called smart power, that they are going to use those proxies, they're going to use propaganda, they're going to use um, all sorts of irregular warfare, which will reduce the cost, they'll get other parties to pay for it. Um, and so that's uh, something that was a really great innovation on the liberal side of politics. Once upon a time, we thought the conservatives were the hawks and the liberals were more uh, diplomatic people. I think that's been reversed in the 21st century. And that smart power coincides with what you were just describing, I think. Well, uh, actually, again, you, you raise an interesting point that I've been thinking about quite a lot in relation to Trump versus the Democrats. Mm -hmm. uh, Hillary Clinton, in a way, personifies the liberal love of war. She even mm. laughs mm. about it. We came, mm. we saw, he died. Mm. Ha, 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 she said uh, of uh, Libya. Mm. It is odd, isn't it, how left and right have changed places? I think it is, and I think the, the, the innovators in, in imperial war have been that liberal wing. I mean, if we go back farther to the 19th century, we'll see, for example, in the English tradition, John Stuart Mill, who's known for his writings on freedom, but was also a great supporter of empire. So there was a very strong liberal tradition supporting empire and having a, this, this uh, view of the world of, um, you know, inconsistent with today's world of international law and, and state sovereignty and so on. Another of your books, uh, Axis of Resistance, uh, talks about how, whether they liked it or not, or wanted it or not, uh, Again, I come back to Cuba. It was not the intention of the Cuban leaders to become, as it were, uh, a part of the uh, Soviet sphere of mm. influence. They were pushed mm. into that. This axis, I don't like the word axis, it has terrible resonance here in the English speaking world. The axis were who we fought mm. in the Second World War, but they've all been pushed together, haven't they? Mm. All those picked on by empire end up, therefore, in the same camp. There's been a great obsession to divide and rule the people of, of the Middle East, of West Asia, and the, the constant efforts to divide uh, Iran from Iraq, for example, beginning with the war in the terrible war in the 80s. Um, but as you say, the result of that constant division uh, has been that they're coming together. Really, the, the big obsession with Iran, coming from Tel Aviv, coming from Washington, is precisely because Iran is supporting the resistance in Palestine, it's supporting the resistance in Lebanon, it's supporting the resistance in Syria and Yemen and Iraq. And so it's right, there's a, they've created their own monster in a way. They've, they're helping bring together the peoples of the region in a way that may have been difficult had they not been under that sort of attack. Now, as we speak, uh, economies are closing down. America's officially in recession, according to the Bank of America today. We are going to experience here in Britain a very substantial 
a fall in output and inevitably recession. Recession could even become depression on the economic front and on the geopolitical front. Are these the last days of empire? Well, it's, it's, it's uh, bold to say those sorts of things, isn't it? Because systems have crises constantly, but uh, I think for a new system to emerge out of this, it has to be built by people. They have to create new systems. Um, uh, people used to say that capitalism would have, was subject to these crises and something new would come out of it. I believe rather that people have to construct new realities out of these sorts of crises, and it depends on organisation. And are they going to? Or is it going to be business as usual come the autumn? I don't think it's going to be business as usual. As you say, the, the economic uh, outlook is very bleak at the moment with uh, all around the world these sorts of restrictions and which are precisely closing down economies all around the world. The illiberal nature of international relations, all of the wars in the Middle East, the, uh, the various conflicts in Latin America also, there's a, an enormous illiberal atmosphere in recent years and I think the, you know, the current corona crisis is going to add to that. Best of luck on your tour and stay healthy. Thanks very Tim much. Tim Anderson, we need you. Thanks very much indeed for joining us.